you for taking the time out to come and be part of this exciting conversation about our shared future. And please write to us what you make of the event today. But for now, on with the show. We still 2013 Cultivate the Intellect. Our third speaker tonight is a St. Louis native, Casey Star Triplett. Now, Casey has dedicated her life to serving her fellow citizens. Initially, that was through politics. She served in the offices of two congressmen, and then she went on to run for alderman of St. Louis, which she won, making her the youngest alderman in St. Louis history. She served for five years before stepping down to radically redirect the trajectory of her career. Here to tell her own story, Casey. So I'm going to share with you a secret. One of my biggest dreams, my biggest desire, was to be mayor of the city of St. Louis. Now some of you may have had a dream to be president or a movie star, actress, but all I ever wanted to do was to be mayor of the city of St. Louis. There's something very special about this city, and as a lifelong resident, I love the city of St. Louis, and I've always loved the city of St. Louis, and I'm not really sure why I had the desire so much to be mayor, but, well, maybe it was because my grandfather, he was a politician, so maybe as they say, doctors breed doctors, lawyers breed lawyers, maybe politicians breed politicians. But we would have conversations all the time about ways to improve the city of St. Louis. And so I grew up always wanting to be mayor. That was my dream, that was my goal. In 1993, our city elected our first African-American mayor. His name was Freeman Bosley, Jr. And the night of his election, the Post dispatched our daily newspaper, took a great picture, a great photo of Freeman with his wife and with his daughter. And I remember that next morning looking at that photograph and deciding to keep the newspaper article because it was such a great time in history. I remember riding in the car one day, a couple of months after that, and got to the intersection of Natural Bridge and Kings Highway a prominent intersection in North St. Louis, and remember seeing a median in the middle of the street that was filled with beautiful rosebuds and flowers, and there was a sign that said, this beautification effort in North St. Louis was made possible by our mayor, Freeman Bosley, Jr. It was such a small moment, but that was really my first moment of really being able to tangibly connect and see the difference of what a politician was able to do. I remember thinking that, wow, that's great. It was because he got elected into office that this beautification effort was here. And I wanted to be able to make that type of impact in the city of St. Louis. So that was my dream, again, to be mayor. And I will tell you that having dreams and having ambitions are great. It's good to have ideas about what you want to be able to accomplish in life. But it's also important to be able to be flexible with those dreams and to be able to listen to the inner voice that speaks to you as you seek to accomplish your goals and dreams. Now, some of you may refer to that little voice as intuition. It might be a conscience to you. But for me, I refer to that little voice as God. It was faith. That's how I refer to it. I had really gotten to know and develop a relationship with God when I first decided to run for alderman at the age of 26. I had been somebody that had gone to church the majority of my life, but really didn't have that type of connection with my faith. But again, it wasn't until I decided to run for office at the age of 26 that I really began to see the power of a higher power working through me to be able to accomplish so much. So the seat for Alderman, which is our city council, it became open about five years ago. 
And like I said always, it was my desire to be able to run for public office and to be mayor one day. So when that seat became open, I immediately threw my hat in the race. I was 26 at the time, and the political establishment, they already had a candidate in mind, and they weren't too happy that I had decided to throw my hat in the race. But I said that no matter what, I'm going to get it 100%. I thought I had some great ideas and ways to contribute to the advancement of the city. I thought about how great it would be to have government that was accessible, to have a leader that was willing to sit and to surround the table with people that traditionally have been left out of city politics and government. So I ran. And I remember quitting my job because, again, I said I wanted to give it 100%. And the election at that time was on March the 6th, and I told myself that on March the 7th, I wanted to be able to look back and know that I had did everything possible to be elected. So I built a team, and when I say a team, it was truly a team. It wasn't just myself. But there were great people who believed in me and believed in the vision of being able to talk to people and being able to connect with people about what we wanted to see our city government look like. And I won. I beat two other opponents that were twice my age, two white males, and made history becoming the youngest elected official in the city of St. Louis and the first African American woman to represent my district. And I will tell you that there was tremendous success. Again, I really felt that there was some favor from the higher power that allowed me to do a lot of great things that a lot of first timer politicians weren't able to do. We created transformational legislation that addressed vacant buildings and abandoned properties in the city. New retail and development came into the district. We also worked to improve the quality of life for our neighborhoods, creating stronger neighborhood systems and neighborhood watch organizations. There was great success that I had as an alderman. I also was able to travel all around the country and sit on conferences and panels was featured in Oprah Magazine, Ebony Magazine, this wonderful, great success. It was great. I also developed wonderful relationships with my constituents. I gave my cell phone number out, and I told people that if you needed me, that this was a cell phone and that you were able to use it because I wanted to hear from you. Those that felt so inclined, they would call and invite me to dinner, and if my schedule was open, I would sit down and have dinner with them. It was really more than just a working relationship. I wanted to get to know the people one-on-one. -on -one. That was the type of legislator that I wanted to be. The area that I represented, it was so diverse. We had wonderful mansions in my district, but we also <coughs> served one of the largest ha public housing complexes in the city as well. So there was a wonderful dichotomy of those that had a lot and then those that didn't have a lot. There was also at least five or six homeless shelters that were either, either located in my district or located within a mile of my district. So just as I developed relationships with those who owned homes, I also developed great relationships with those that were homeless. And it was important for me to understand their plight as well. Again, I wanted to be the different type of politician that got to know everyone. And so I talked a lot about that you know, I was able to be successful. I felt good. I felt that I was making a difference in the city of St. Louis. But there was one area that I really felt that I wasn't making much of a dent. And that was when it came to addressing homelessness in the city of St. Louis. I found myself constantly running into brick walls with really trying to navigate the issue of being able to provide housing for everyone that needed housing. The final straw was when I came across a friend, and I'll just call him, his name was Mr. Muhammad. Mr. Muhammad was a very proud man. He was a man of great distinguishment. He always wore a bow tie, and he walked with a cane. And I knew he was homeless, even though he really didn't talk a lot about it. But one day he called me and he said, Alderman Triplett, are there any vacant properties in your area where I can sleep at? tonight. You know, the shelters just aren't working for me. I just need a place that I can sleep that nobody will bother me. And I thought to myself, 
that this was his option, that this was his reality of sleeping in a vacant house. And I didn't know of any vacant homes that, you know, he would be able to access entry rate. But I remember feeling so frustrated at his situation. And as a politician, you always feel like you should have the answers to be able to help people. But I wasn't able to help Mr. Muhammad find a house. And that was frustrating to me. And I remember that night praying to God and being extremely frustrated that, hey, you put me here in this position. You put me here to represent this area that has at least five or six homeless shelters. Why don't you allow me or give me the capability to be able to solve this solution? I remember <laughs> praying about that and feeling so frustrated, but after praying, there was a sense of peace. And besides, I had a lot of other stuff to be able to deal with and address with too. So I left that in prayer with God. And I will tell you, not too long after that, I received a call. A friend called to let me know that there was a new nonprofit organization that was for me that was going to look at the overwhelmingly use of emergency departments by people who were homeless and mentally ill. They were looking for someone to serve as a project director to help steer the project and to make recommendations to improve the quality of life for those who were homeless and mentally ill. I knew at that moment that this was an answer to the prayer that I had sent up. Because one thing that I neglected to mention was, when I prayed to God and asked him and told him that he needed to do something about the homeless crisis in our city, I also told him that I wanted to be part of the solution. That here I was as an alderman ready to be of use and ready to be of service to the community, and that I wanted to be part of the solution. So when the opportunity came up, I knew that I was supposed to apply and take that position. But I will tell you that it was difficult because my dream, you guys, was always to be mayor of the city of St. Louis. <coughs> People who have, hold elected office don't just quit that elected office to resign and work for a nonprofit dealing with homelessness, dealing with people who are mentally ill. That's not a sexy or a popular issue. But I knew in my heart that it was something that I was supposed to do because I was connected to that inner voice. And I'm here to challenge you to be connected to your inner voice. Sometimes we can always have a big dream, but I believe whether you call it the higher power or the universe, there's always a bigger dream more than you can ever imagine if you're able to tap in and connect to that source. So that's what I did. I resigned from my position as alderman to take on this new role to be an advocate for those who are homeless and mentally ill. And I will tell you that when you listen to your inner voice, not everyone will always agree. I remember telling people that, hey, I'm going to resign. I'm going to take on this new position. It's going to be great. We're going to be able to solve this issue of homelessness. I really feel like I'm going to be able to make an impact. A lot of people thought that I was nuts. Why would you give that up? You have such great success. You want to be mayor, remember. But I also had to remember that it was my inner voice. The inner voice had spoken to me. It hadn't spoken to everyone else. And that's why it's so important to hold tight to your dreams. I knew that every skill, every talent, every connection that I had made as an alderman had prepared me to be able to take this next step. You know, it's admirable to have a great dream serving as mayor of the city of St. Louis. There's nothing wrong with that dream. But what would have been wrong is to continue to hold on to that dream, constantly focus on growing higher and climbing the political ladder without using the gifts and the talents that God had given me to serve people who were most in need. So I hope that this will be a great lesson as your students here at Washington University to tap into the inner voice. What is it that you feel that a higher power is telling you to do and to use your talents and resources to serve the greater <laughs> good? Don't get stuck in the bubble of doing what you feel people expect you to do. But tap in and really understand, and really understand and come to know, why are you here? What's your greater purpose? I know without a doubt that I'm in the right place. 
a lot of people may not understand why I did what I did. But when you listen to your inner voice, there's a sense of peace that comes with knowing what you know is what you know. And I will tell you, by me being in this position, I've been able to meet a lot of great people and I know that we're on a trajectory of being able to help people who are homeless and mentally ill. I also know that the dream has been widened. It's been widened and open. And I'm here also um, hosting a, a radio show, um, speaking in prisons, and, and being able to meet a lot more people. So I just encourage you to listen to the inner voice and do what's best for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Casey.